Well, good morning. Good to have you with us again in this rather unusual format, but nevertheless one that has to deal with uh, the situation that we're in. But we're glad that you're here and we trust you'll have your Bible and study with us. This morning we're dealing with a message, a message from confinement. We're dealing with, of course, the Apostle Paul. So, to begin with, if you would, the book of Acts chapter 28. Paul had been in confinement in Caesarea. He got through a series of uh, governors, uh, Felix and Festus, concerned that Festus was being played by the Jews. In chapter 25, he uh, said, I appeal to Caesar. And as a, a Roman citizen, he had the privilege to do so. And so the governor simply stated that he appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. But the governor had a problem because he had no charges to lay against Paul. And so if he sent Paul to the, to the emperor without any charges, it looked rather uh, unusual on the governor. So he enlists the help of, uh, of uh, King Agrippa, one who was more familiar with the Jews and their customs. And after King Agrippa had heard Paul's defense in Acts 26, he made a comment, verse 32, this man may have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And so he appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar he had to go. In Acts 28, we find Paul having endured a journey to Rome, which involved a sustained terrible storm, even being uh, shipwrecked. Now he's in Rome. You observe in chapter 28 and uh, in verse 19, when the Jewish leaders come to Paul there in Rome, he makes the point that he was forced to appeal to Caesar. Nothing against his people, the Jews, but he was forced to appeal to Caesar. And there in Rome, you'll observe in verse 30, he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him. He was said, well, sounds kind of cushy being in his own rented quarters, not in prison, but in his own rented quarters, and inviting all who came to visit him. But you notice also in verse 16, he was allowed to stay in his own, in his own uh, quarters with a soldier who was guarding him. Furthermore, in verse 20, he speaks of the chain I am wearing. So it wasn't really a very cushy situation. He wasn't thrown in some dungeon. He had his own rented quarters, but they were a soldier, probably being continually rotated, and he was wearing a chain. So in this time of confinement, he may be forced to stay home and watch television. The Apostle Paul, he was in a very different situation. Being there for two full years, it's during this time he wrote the books of Ephesus, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, and he also wrote to the beloved uh, Philemon. But this morning our focus is upon the letter he wrote to the church in Philippi. So if you would, book of Philippians in chapter 4 in particular, and specifically verse 13. This verse, probably a close second to John 3 verse 16. I can, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall perish but have eternal life. And this verse, verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It probably comes a close second to the most quoted verse in the New Testament. But the question is, what, what is Paul saying? And uh, how does it apply both to his time of confinement and to us in this time of our confinement? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The King James says, uh, through Christ who strengthens me. So I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. Is this therefore sort of a poster child for a positive mental attitude? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Just me in Christ, I can, I can do anything. I, it's un, unbounded what I can do with, with Christ. The British Army conducted an experiment some years ago. The objective of the experiment was to identify the relationship of mental attitude to physical strength. 
Part of this experiment involved volunteers with a grip device, a grip device that would measure the strength of their grip. When they were first given that test, they had, a, they had an average grip of 110 pounds. Then under hypnosis, these same men had a combined grip of 29 pounds. Very same men, but under hypnosis being told they were weak, only could muster 29 pounds. Then the same men under hypnosis being told they were very strong, their combined grip now was 142 pounds. So you observe that they were, they were uh, some 40 percent stronger when they thought they were stronger, and now some 70 percent weaker when they thought they were weaker. The interesting side light that a negative influence of thought seems to have more influence on the individual than a positive. But the point is, he was this experiment, and they were strong when they were convinced that they were strong. So the same way, I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me. So if I, if I feel strength in Christ, if I, if I give myself to Christ, there's no telling what I can do. I can accomplish almost anything. Is that Paul's message? Well, actually, his message is quite the opposite. You observe here in verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The term strengthen is in the present tense, which means it's a continuous process. And also strengthens is a causative verse. And the idea being to infuse power or strength into. If when Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, Christ continually strengthened Paul and did so as long as Paul understood that was the source of his strength. And so he makes a mention in the book of Romans 15 and verse 18. I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. See, the big difference, a big difference between saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and saying, as I believe Paul was saying, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. An entirely different perspective. Oftentimes people will question their ability, but very few will have second thoughts about their importance. So you observe what Paul is saying here, can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Are you old enough to remember the Merv Griffin show? Well, maybe you can't. Maybe like me, you had to rely upon your elders telling you about Merv Griffin. But Merv was interviewing a bodybuilder one time. And he asked the bodybuilder, why did you develop these particular muscles? The bodybuilder didn't answer. He got up and began to flex his muscles from the chest down to his calves. The audience clapped enthusiastically. The man sat down quite pleased. Then may I ask another question, so well, what do you use these muscles for? Again, they wanted to do the same thing, they get up and do the same process, and biceps and triceps were pu pushing out in a very impressive array. He sat down, but may have persisted. What do you use these muscles for? And the bodybuilder had no answer, <laughs> he never thought about that. Never thought why he had developed those muscles. Mainly, of course, for appearance. It looked good, it impressed me. The audience applauded. Women gasped, I'm sure. But what did he develop those muscles for? See, with Paul, it wasn't a matter of saying, boy, I can do all things. But he, he had the understanding that it was through Christ he could do all things. The power wasn't of his own. It was a power infused by Christ. In doing so, he observed in verse 11, Know that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. 
and you preserve his circumstance there in Rome for two full years, the rotation of Roman guards, and also being in a chain. He said, I have learned to be content in whatever situation I am. This term, having learned to be content, content is the idea of being sufficient to oneself, not relying upon circumstances. And so how would it do that? At that day and time, of course, Stoics were seeking to do the same thing. Men would seek the same objective today, but through meditation or other methods, they seek to block out all feelings, all emotions, all hurts, just feel nothing, just put them, out of, put them, put them away. And this, of course, is accomplished by exertion of uh, a determined act of will. But you observe what Paul says here. He had learned to be content. And the idea of learned is by use or by practice. So by experience, by his own use and practice, he had learned to be content because he learned the source of power. If you would, the book of the Second Corinthians, in chapter 12. And he had this lesson applied. Paul makes no one a need that he had. He had what he called a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. But he says concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul said, I'd rather boast about my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content. Notice again, content. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, none of these be pleasant. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. See, he had learned by use and practice. He had learned the source of his power. He said, I have learned. How different from the church in Laodicea, book of Revelation chapter 3. He was a congregation that in the world perspective needed nothing. I am wealthy, I need nothing. They were Christ's church, but needed nothing, which also would mean they didn't really mean Christ. And Christ let them know their true condition. Wretched, invisible, poor, and blind, and naked. For lying upon themselves, and their power, and what they had accomplished, and their wealth, but spiritually, like babies crawling on the ground. The Apostle Paul recognized the paradox of Christianity, and it is a paradox. We don't overcome by grim determination, by our ability and by our strength. We accomplish by surrender, by surrendering to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his confinement, and whatever confinement we're in, no matter the situation, our strength and ability to cope is by relying upon his power, allowing Christ to infuse us with ability and power to deal with whatever situation we're facing. So the point is, if these principles are true in our life, as they were in the Apostle Paul's life, then shouldn't the same results be seen in our life? So the question is, how did others see Paul? Well, we observed here, book of Acts, chapter 28, and verse 30, he was welcoming those who came to visit him. We also observed in Philippians 4 that the church in Philippi sent a gift to him by the hand of Epaphroditus. 
would you go and see somebody, would you go and visit somebody who was uh, consumed with bitterness, anger, resentment, the situation they were in, or who kept whimpering in fear of what's going to be lying ahead? See, Paul knew, as he says in chapter 2, he was trusting he would come and see them. He knew this wasn't going to last. Now, it's different from 2 Timothy. But he knew that he had been ready to be poured out. That was the end. But now, here in this two-year period, he knew it wasn't going to last. And he was trusting to come and visit them. He kept his head. And he also recognized that uh, this was going to pass. And so others were coming to him. He was one who drew people to him. So if I can say I can do all things through him who strengthens me, Shouldn't my life demonstrate that? A man was driving down the road. He's driving the road, he comes to the intersection, and he saw the lights turning yellow. So rather than trying to gun the car and get through the lights before they turn red, he did the right thing. He slowed down, and by the time he came to the intersection, the lights turned red and he was stopped. There was a lady who had been tailgating him. You know how people drive sometimes with barely two coats of paint between them? Well, she'd been driving by it very close. And she wasn't pleased with the fact he had stopped. In fact, she was infuriated. Her telephone, her cell phone went flying, her makeup went flying. And of course, cell phones and makeup are vital for driving a car. And they went flying. And she was so infused, she was so enraged, she began yelling and shouting, waving her hand, making some very obscene gestures, and yelling at the top of her voice. In mid rant she heard a knock on her window look up into the face of a rather serious police officer. He'd order her out of the car, come to the back of the car with a hand on the, on the trunk, took her driver's license, went back and checked. When he came back, he gave her back her driver's license, the boy said, all oh, seems to be in order. She said, well, what's the problem, officer? She said, when I drove up behind you, and I could see your mud and the gesturing and the things you were indicating by your gestures, I could hear you, you know, I could hear you yelling and shouting and what, what you were shouting I could hear. And then I noticed on your bumper, you had a couple of stickers. One said, what would Jesus do? The other bumper sticker said, follow me to Bible class. I saw your number plate, it was one of those number plates that says, choose life. And I saw the car had one of those fish emblem is that believers oftentimes put on their car. So I apologize, but I simply assumed you had stolen the car. It wouldn't be tragic if people would see in our lives things that would seem to be completely out of harmony, out of place with our claim to be Christians. You see, what others saw in Paul was I can do all things through him and strengthens me. This wasn't simply a memory verse for Paul. This was how he lived. He had kept his head. He knew this wasn't going to last. And he knew that what would last was a bond in Jesus Christ. As I said in the book of Romans, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And so whatever situation he was in, whatever situation we are in, as Christians, we know we belong to the Lord. And like Paul, learn contentment, whatever situation we happen to be in. But then on the other side of the same coin, not only how did others see Paul, how did Paul see others? In chapter 1, you see his concern for the church. I pray that your love may abound more and more in real knowledge and all the servant. He reminded him in chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. And writing to the church in Colossae about the same time as they wrote to the church in Philippi, he urged them, If then you've been raised up with Christ, keep sticking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. And you observe also in chapter 4 and verse 22, 
It speaks of the saints in Caesar's household. The only way they could be saints in Caesar's household if individuals have been taught of Christ Jesus. And you observe Paul having this rotation of Roman guards. When people came to visit him, you think Paul was sitting there sort of embarrassed. You think he was rather intimidated. Hardly. As they came to visit him, and Paul was communicating with them, well, he'd be commu communicating what was on his heart. What was on his heart continually was the message of Jesus Christ. You see, what that points out is, Christ's great commission was never far from his mind. All authority had been given to me in heaven and in earth, said Jesus. And go there to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that commanded you, and lo and with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission was in Paul's mind continually. No matter the situation, his concern for those lost to become Christians, and so those saints in Caesar's household, his concern for those who are Christians to remain faithful, don't allow things to overwhelm you, be faithful in Christ Jesus. But then he also tells Christians in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Be imitators of me as I am also of Christ. So many things about Paul's life, of course, we can use as an example for us. One example there in Philippians chapter 2. Well, he couldn't be with them, but nevertheless, he knew people. He knew the, 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 the problems that arise. He knew the, 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 the uh, pressures that arise. He knew also individual traits. And so he urges, in verse 2 of chapter 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent in one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. Because Paul knew how selfishness and self-centeredness can be a terrible cancer in the body of Christ Jesus. Christ's prayer, the all should be one who are believers in him through the words of the apostles in John 17. Even as he and the Father are one that they all may be one. Indeed, in verse 23, to be united in unity. That's our Lord's standard. Anything or anyone that has a negative effect upon that unity is entirely out of harmony with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul, although he couldn't be there, was urging him to live and to walk as disciples should. Follow his example. And so Paul again, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And there in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Notice, in confinement, or any situation, it was always in the Lord he gained strength, in the Lord he had cause for rejoicing. It is in the Lord that our assurance rests. So while we are in the midst of a rather trying situation, thankfully in this area, we're not experiencing the things that others are going through, whether in New York and now over there in Louisiana and elsewhere, we're not experiencing that degree. The local authorities have stepped in and made sure they've done all they can to ensure that we don't. And this might cause some problems in families, even if you're home with the kiddies and husbands there, doing what husbands do, getting in the way sometimes. But no matter what the situation, no matter how frustrating it might become, we have this challenge. Remember where our strength lies. From whom we gain strength, from whom we gain the ability to deal with life, always in Christ. And in Christ we can rejoice. In Christ Jesus. This surely is the sweetest term for believers. Remember Paul's words in the book of Romans chapter 6. 
Those of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, been baptized into his death. Being buried with him through baptism into death, that as Christ was raised, so also we were raised to walk in newness of life. What Paul's emphasis in verse 5. We become united with them in the likeness of his death, that is, being baptized. Then certainly we shall be with them in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul knew the situation in Rome was passing. But isn't that true of our lives? We're passing. But I live, and you can live as Christians, not to fretting and frustration and fear, anxiety. But in Christ, we have this assurance. Our Lord is with us. He will never desert us. He will never forsake us. And in Christ, we have that assurance. Certainly, we should be with them in that time of resurrection. Our prayers are with you all. We share the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. God be with you, brother. Thank you.